Welcome everyone to Half History Full Travel. I am your host, the Wilder Historian, and this is part 8 of my series on Winfield Scott Hancock. As the war progressed, Hancock's reputation grew, and during the Gettysburg Campaign, not only did his reputation grow, but his standing within the Army of the Potomac skyrocketed. After the military disaster that was the Battle of Chancellorsville, the Army of the Potomac went through drastic changes. For one, Darius Couch, the commander of the 2nd Corps, became so disgusted by the actions or lack of action by Army Commander Joseph Hooker that he requested reassignment, which he received. Hancock was the natural choice for Couch's position, but his rise to Corps command would come about during a tumultuous time. Abraham Lincoln and other commanders were irritated at Hooker's actions, so the tensions within the Army was immense. But Robert E. Lee and the Army of Northern Virginia were on the move, causing more problems for the Federals. Due to Jeb Stuart's screening movements, all Hooker knew was that the Confederate Army was moving, but had no idea where. Slowly, the blue troops began moving north, chasing after the rebels. It was during this pursuit that Lincoln relieved Hooker of command, an action that took Hooker by surprise since a large battle was imminent. The president had searched for a replacement. One of his first choices was John Reynolds, commander of the First Corps, but he wanted to be assured that he wouldn't be drawn into political infighting in Washington, D.C. Finally, Lincoln settled on George Meade, but there were rumors that Hancock was considered, but Winfield wrote to his wife that he would have refused had he been offered the position. Now, the Union Army was under a new commander, and Hancock had been in command of a corps for less than a month as this grand campaign was being launched. Meade threw himself into making the best of it. After meeting with Meade, Hancock commented that the commander seemed nervous, but unlike other commanders, he was not afraid of Lee. One notable incident of the campaign related to Hancock was that when the 2nd Corps arrived at Uniontown, Maryland, the locals informed him that Jeb Stuart's cavalry were occupying Westminster just four miles away. Hancock sent word to Meade about the possibility of possibly capturing such an illustrious prize, but Union Cavalry Commander Alfred Pleasanton assured Meade that two Union brigades of cavalry were at Westminster and the locals must have been mistaken. In reality, there were no Federal cavalry in the town. It was indeed Jeb Stuart. But since Pleasanton convinced Meade it wasn't, Hancock did not act on the information. Another significant moment happened for Hancock on the campaign. General French, one of his division commanders, requested an independent command, which he received. Hancock's longtime friend, Alexander Hayes, was then given command of French's division. By the very end of June, Union Corps were converging near the town of Gettysburg on a crash course with elements of A.P. Hill's Confederate Corps. On July 1st, they collided, and Confederate reinforcements began outflanking the Union troops. Word got to Meade that an engagement was underway, and that Reynolds had either been seriously wounded or killed. Either way, there needed to be an overall commander on the field. Meade quickly met with Hancock and told him to ride ahead, leaving his corps in the command of General Gibbon and take command of all the corps at Gettysburg. Winfield pointed out that Oliver Otis Howard, the commander of the 11th Corps, outranked him, but Meade assured him that all necessary steps were taken and that he was to take control of the situation. If he could find good ground in that vicinity, take it, but if not, he was to retreat to Pipe Creek to form a defensive line that Meade had mapped out. Off Hancock Road, but for about three miles, he opted to ride in an ambulance, not for any medical reason, but he needed to study the maps of the area in preparation for a taking command. Once he had familiarized himself with the terrain, he again mounted his horse and rode hard for Gettysburg. He arrived at 3.30 p.m. on Cemetery Hill, the location of Howard's Reserve and one of the only places still under firm Union control. Although the next event has many versions, most with only slight differences, most historians agree with the following account. When he informed Howard, his senior, that he had been placed in command and had written orders to prove it, Howard allegedly made a small fuss about military protocol, but nevertheless, Hancock quickly began issuing orders regardless of what the other corps commanders thought. It was Hancock who ordered James Wadsworth's division to secure Culp's Hill, seeing it as militarily significant. He also sent Geary's division from the 12th Corps to secure the Union left near two round hills to the south. Next, Hancock sent his aide, Major William G. Mitchell, with information to give to Meade. He informed the Army commander that he possessed a strong position and would hold out until nightfall to see if Meade wanted to bring up the whole army. Meade simply stated, I will send up the troops. At 6 p.m. with the lines for the most part stabilized, 
Hancock found General Slocum and turned over command to him. Then Winfield rode to Tawnytown to report to General Meade in person. After their meeting, Hancock exhausted after a long day, stretched out and got a few hours of sleep, but was awake at midnight, riding to rejoin the 2nd Corps just outside of Gettysburg. One of the most common discussions about the Battle of Gettysburg revolves around a what-if question. What if the Confederates had pushed on and taken Cemetery Hill? In an 1878 letter to Fitzhugh Lee, Hancock answers that very question. He stated, I do not think the Confederate force then present could have carried it out. He made that statement because he saw the confusion within the Confederate ranks when they pushed into the town. That is one problem with a victorious assault. Afterward, the battle lines are very confused and malformed. Hancock believed that by the time all the Confederate officers reformed their lines, rounded up all the prisoners, and resupplied the ranks, he had the Union position secure. On the night of July 1st, the Second Corps camped in between the Tawny Town Road and Big Round Top, just in case Lee decided to shift southwest and turn the Union line. The next day, Hancock placed his corps on Cemetery Ridge, with Hayes near Ziegler's Grove, Gibbon's division in the center, and Caldwell on the left. To the left of Hancock's Second Corps was the Third Corps under Daniel Sickles. On July 2nd, Sickles made a horrible mistake. By thinking his position untenable, he moved out his divisions to occupy a position further west along the Emmitsburg Road, disconnecting from the Second Corps to his right and not anchoring his left flank. Hancock watched in amazement as he saw Sickles' men marching without orders. By the time Meade found out about the movement, it was too late to pull back safely because Confederate General James Longstreet's Corps was launching a massive assault against the exposed Third Corps. The next hour saw the Fifth Corps under Sykes attempt to shore up the position around Little Round Top, the Wheatfield, and Devil's Den. However, the advance by Sickles exposed Hancock's left flank, thus Winfield had to send Caldwell's division to the aid of Sykes and Sickles. The Third Corps' mistake would cost Hancock's Corps dearly. Caldwell's 1st Brigade under Colonel Edward E. Cross headed toward Devil's Den to drive out the rebels. The Irish Brigade, after receiving the general absolution from Father William Corby, moved into the woods just south of the wheat field. Next, Zook's Brigade made its way into the Carnage Field area. Caldwell even sent in his reserve under Colonel John R. Brooke, but on his right, the Union forces were given way from attacks by Kershaw's South Carolinians and Barksdale's Mississippians. So, Caldwell had to pull back his division. Three of his four brigade commanders were casualties. Zook and Cross were both mortally wounded, and Brooke was severely wounded. When Sickles was wounded, losing a leg, Meade placed Hancock in charge of the 3rd Corps as well. Winfield rode to the left of his line, bringing Willard's brigade from Hayes' division. Barksdale's Mississippians were on their way to Cemetery Ridge. Hancock placed Willard's men in their way, but to his right he saw what he thought was Union infantry, but a volley from their ranks that wounded his aide signaled to him that it was the enemy. Hancock quickly looked about and saw a 300-man regiment coming up from the rear. He rode over to them and said, Do you see those colors? Take them. The regiment was the 1st Minnesota, who charged into Wilcox's brigade of Confederates. They paid a frightful cost, but they had halted the rebel advance. Further to the right, Ambrose Wright's Georgians pressed Hancock's men at the stone wall along Cemetery Ridge, but the Southerners were thrown back, but not after gaining much ground. Abner Doubleday said of Hancock that day, he was indefatigable, and his vigilance and personal supervision, patching the line wherever the enemy was likely to break through. His activity and foresight probably preserved the ridge from capture. Even as nightfall began to cover the battlefield, Hancock's exploits were not complete. On the far end of his line at Cemetery Hill, he heard the roaring sound of battle and dispatched Carroll's brigade of Hayes' division to offer any assistance he could to Oliver Otis Howard's position. They arrived just in time to send back the rebels from the ground they had gained in the bloody fight. He also sent two regiments to Culp's Hill to repel the evening assaults against that position. That night, Meade summoned all of his corps commanders to meet at his headquarters. In a room about ten feet square, they discussed what happened that day and what to do next. It was agreed that the position they held at that moment was a strong one and to stay put. They also agreed that they should wait on Lee to make the next move but there was some debate on how long they should wait. However, with no clear decision about the wait time, Meade left it up to his own discretion and the council broke up. Generals Hancock, John Gibbon, and John Newton then found a second corps ambulance, crawled in, and went to sleep. Hancock was up early getting his troops ready. 
Meade concluded earlier that Lee would strike the center of his line where Hancock's men were located, but by 9 a.m., Meade met with Hancock and had changed his opinion. He now believed that an attack would come on the left again. An associate of Gibbon captured a tough old rooster and with the help of some taters, turned it into a stew. As Gibbon and Hancock sat on some old stools delighting in the welcome new food variety, Meade and a staff member, General Newton and General Pleasanton, happened by and they all got a portion of the meal. After the meal, the officers sat under a tree passing the day pretty lazily, talking about the battle the day before. After about an hour, Pleasanton, Newton, and Meade left. Hancock could see the rebels on Seminary Ridge placing their artillery in preparation for something. When the gigantic artillery barrage let loose from the rebel guns, the men of the 2nd Corps hugged the ground, and 77 pieces of Union artillery began firing back. The guns fired for nearly two hours, and the artillerymen began to slacken their fire or stop altogether to conserve ammunition. Hancock became concerned for his infantry because he knew that in the event of an artillery barrage, the best morale boost for infantry is to have their own artillery firing back. So Winfield ordered all of his 2nd Corps artillery to keep letting loose volleys. He even ordered gun crews not under his command to continue, but Lieutenant Colonel Freeman McGilvery refused the orders for his crews. He stated that Hancock had no authority to give him such an order. The two battled with profane language, but Hancock could not convince the man to do as he ordered. Hancock was on the left of his line when Pickett's charge began. He commented in his after-action report how well the battle lines were dressed as they moved across the field. His artillery had used up all their long-range ammunition and thus waited for the enemy to get closer to use their canister. Hayes on the right broke up the brigades of Brock and Braun Davis. Generals Lewis Armistead and Richard Garnett, who had attended the party with Hancock right before they left for war, had been very good friends with him, and they were in Pickett's division, barreling toward the copse of trees, the focal point of the Confederate advance. Garnett would be killed, and Armistead would be severely wounded and die a few days later. But as he lay wounded on the ground, Captain Henry Bingham told Armistead that he was a member of Hancock's staff, and he would make sure any of his effects were taken care of. Armistead told Bingham, Say to General Hancock for me that I have done him and you all a grievous injury which I shall always regret. After shoring up the breakthrough that Armistead and his men swarmed into, Hancock moved over to the left, finding the 13th Vermont there. He ordered them to turn and perform a flanking maneuver against the Confederate right. About that time, Hancock was wounded in the groin. The men from Vermont helped him off his horse and laid him on the ground, but he refused to be moved until the battle was over, so he propped himself up on one elbow and watched over the battle. The commander of the 16th Vermont and Hancock's friend passed by, and Winfield said to him, Go in, Colonel, and give it to them on the flank. The Vermonters did as they were told and broke up what was left of the Confederate assault. Only after the hostilities had ended did Hancock allow for the Corps surgeon to examine him. Hancock and Armistead had come a long way from Los Angeles, wounded just a few hundred yards apart, fighting one another. In true Hancock military fashion, he took his responsibility as an officer seriously. So when he was loaded into an ambulance and the wagon took off, he quickly ordered it to stop so he could dictate to the surgeon a letter to be given to General Meade. I have never seen a more formidable attack, and if the 6th and 5th Corps have pressed up, the enemy will be destroyed. The enemy must be short of ammunition, as I was shot with a ten-penny nail. I did not leave the field till the victory was entirely secured, and the enemy no longer in sight. I am badly wounded, but I trust not seriously. I had to break the line to attack the enemy in flank on my right, where the enemy was most persistent after their front attack was propelled. Not a rebel was in sight upright when I left. The line should be immediately restored and perfected. General Caldwell is in command of the Corps, and I have directed him to restore the line. The ten penny nail that he mentioned in his address to Meade had actually came from his saddle, along with some wood into the wound. The surgeon was able to probe with his finger and extract the ten penny nail and stop the blood, but it was a serious wound so close to a main artery. When he made it to the hospital for the Corps, his men crowded around him and gave shouts of acclamation. He attempted to address the crowd, but weak from blood loss, he fainted into his comrade's arms. Any time the Army of the Potomac was in action, Hancock would wire his wife a message letting her know he was safe. He had wired her that morning saying he was alright so far. Without including too much information, he informed her that he had been wounded and to meet him in Philadelphia 
where he was to recover. Thank you all so much for watching. I hope this video demonstrates how integral Hancock was to the Union Army's performance at Gettysburg. He truly stepped up to the responsibility given to him by Meade, and his actions undoubtedly saved the Army of the Potomac from a possible defeat. Thank you all again. Part 9 will come out next week, and have a great day.